said recently that longing is a gift and that it only stays around for a certain amount of time and after a great deal of incapacity um, that it goes away and it only visits once in a while. Um, and I wonder what, if anything, comes in its place. You know, if you were to simplify this, if you consider longing to be the cause of a good amount of pain and discomfort, I think our organism is wired in a way that it just shuts down after a while. It's just too much. You know, it's like you love someone and you continue loving them and when you love someone you make a lot of sacrifices and that gradually takes a toll on you especially if you don't see any return and there comes a point out of survival you know where doubt creeps in and these are I mean, in some ways it could be bad but I think it's also very good because your body very instinctually kind of sabotages the emotion in order to self-preserve, you know. Krishnamurti was doing this interview with Houston Smith. It was like 1970-some. And, you know, he was just like 80-some-year-old man trying to talk to this academic who likes to spiritualize things, you know. And of course, he had written this book, Religions of the World, that had become very popular. And so he talks to him, and once in a while, Smith throws out, well, didn't Krishna in Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita say A, B, C, D? And Krishna Murti would just go crazy. He would say, I don't care about Krishna. I don't care about Arjuna. I don't care about Hinduism. And Houston Smith would kind of smile and say, well, you don't really mean that. Or, I know what you're doing. And Krishnamurti would say, you have no idea. Just shut your mouth. And when the interview was done, Krishnamurti said, I don't want to interview. I don't want to have an interview with this guy anymore. You know, I'm done with this, this guy. And the point I guess I'm trying to make is, Initially, when you experience something that creates a good amount of longing inside you, and remember what longing is. Longing is a very, very, very intense desire. And remember how desires function. When you desire something, you make this journey to go get it. You just don't desire something say, oh, well, you know, it looks good. I just want to sit back and just watch it. It doesn't work that way, you know. Uh, so whenever there is a desire, and that desire is no longer casual, it has reached the want, it has reached the stage of a need, 
where now at, at the stage of need you're just emotionally entangled that is what the longing is your heart is broken and you want it to be men you know you want it to be healed and so you do all sorts of things you sit you meditate you pray you read books because you want an experience in other words you want someone or something to see the sacrifices see the brokenness and then reward you give you an answer now, it's very, very, very difficult where you just long, but you don't get anything in return. There comes a point where your longing begins to sting you. It becomes poisonous. The longing that used to inspire you to write poetry now forces you to have this great amount of anger and hate and disgust towards the object. You know, it's kind of like Aesop's fable, the sour grapes. You know, you have this fox who longs for grapes and he uses all of his cunningness to get the grapes, but he doesn't. No matter what he does, how much he tries, how intensely, you know, his desire for grapes may be, he just can't get them. And then he walks away saying, ah, they probably just suck anyways, they're just bad, you know. And it's the way we cope, you know. And so your suggestion is, okay, so this, this experience that creates a good amount of longing and desire, there comes a point where you realize your desire is not satisfied. Whether the person is not satisfying you, or maybe you just don't have the capacity to make it, go. So out of self-respect or self-preservation or survival of your emotional or your intellectual, you walk away. Your body basically shuts down. And then you go somewhere, you take a break. And then you say, okay, well, you know, I'm living my life. My life is good. There's nothing wrong with it. But all of a sudden, I long for this. Now you go back. I think when you go back the second time around, your life is a little bit fuller. You're a bit more educated. You have been stung once. And so you're very, very careful. You become much more political. Uh, that's not always the case. And I say that because of Carlos Castaneda. You know, he. He ran into this old man and he fell in love with him. He worked with him for, I think, two or three or four years. And then he got really, really scared. He realized that his life is just slipping through his fingers. He has nothing to walk on, stand on. And he just left. You know? Sometimes when you leave, you know, after longing but never getting an answer, you don't leave to go back to life and make your life work. You leave because the longing is so much, you need some kind of a distraction. And like Kierkegaard, you hope that these distractions will just help you forget the whole thing. You know, but very much like Kierkegaard, Carl Castaneda, despite all of his cunningness to distract himself from going back to Don Juan and, you know, forgetting all the things that he had learned from him, he just couldn't. And he goes back. And he stays with Don Juan until the day he dies. You know. It depends on the longing. It depends on how you walk away from the longing and it depends on how you go back to the longing. Um, I think if your longing has depth and if your teacher has baptized you in the sense that 
you're not longing for this thing because you're just lonely and pathetic, because you have no friends, you know, because your parents are dead or because your parents are divorced or because you just left your boyfriend, your girlfriend. If your intentions, if the toxins or contaminants have been hammered out, and here you are very clean and there is your desire and you genuinely want it um, but it's just too much work and you don't it, it all of a sudden happens to you it's not like after a month or two you realize it's too much little by little you realize there's just too much to give up too much to sacrifice too much to lose and it becomes very frightening because we are creatures after power and power gives you knowledge and knowledge allows you to control your environment you know um, and when you lose what little really you have in life um, it's very difficult to just give your life up to someone you hardly know and they demand I mean, just strange things from you You know, the other thing about longing, Cassie, is if you can stay in it for a while, it stabilizes itself. In other words, you will grow a thick enough of a skin that you can handle the pain. You know, it's kind of like what Attar says, Initially, when you put your toes in the ocean of sorrow, you say, oh, this is too much. But then you say, well, maybe I should just go ankle deep. And you say, oh, it's too much. Then you say, maybe I should just go knee deep. You know, you say, oh, well, you know, it's too much, but it's getting better. I mean, it's sorrow, it's painful. And the problem with sorrow is that you can no longer have fun with anything. I mean, it's like laughter just disappears from your soul. You know, you just, all you have are just tears and pain and longing and yearning and loneliness and despair. Man, like Job, we just live in darkness, you know. It's what they call Shabbat Yalda, the longest night of the year. That, you know, the sun never rises, it just never comes your way. It's always just dark. And, but there is something about you that enjoys a sorrow, that despite the fact that your toe says, get the hell out, you say, no, let me go just go ankle. And despite both toe and ankle say, get out, you say, no, let me go knee deep. And little by little you realize, man, this is such a nice ocean to swim in sorrow it makes me profoundly self-sufficient I don't need anybody because no one can really make me happy I don't need to read books because I can write poetry you know I don't need to fall in love with some person and they leave me and I cry you know, I just have enough sorrow inside me where I can just cry at will and you really become like Hosko and this particular sorrow for someone like Attar, you know, is, is connected to love. It has to be the right kind of love, you know. And I think one of the things that good teachers like Idrisha, like Bhai Sahib do, is that they first... I mean, if you pay attention to Attar of Fire, Irina loves him. And that's a great trick because you need that. You need this person to love you. And when they love you, now they're ready to make sacrifices. Now you can play with them. And Baisai plays with Irina. He takes everything away from her, everything. She becomes completely dependent on this man. And little by little, he teaches her how to detach. And there are moments in the book where he looks at her and says, you know I'm going to die, and you got to figure this out on your own. 
And she goes home, she says, I just can't do this. Why the hell does he talk to me in this way? You know? And then he dies. I mean, she's been seasoned, and then he dies. She takes about five or six years of a break. And then when the break is over, she comes out. She's resurrected, and she's really, really good. I mean, I mean, good in the sense that she's independent. She's really not a great teacher. She, she's awful. Um, she's very animated. She's a powerhouse. But as far as teachers go, she's, you know. But the point is, you know, uh, this sorrow has to be connected to the right longing. This longing has to be connected to the right kind of a love. This love must be towards the right kind of a person. And as long as you have that, that's fine. There are also these, you know, special cases where from nowhere all of a sudden something very magical happens to you. You don't need a teacher, you don't need to go on a quest. You know, things just open up, you see things and uh, little by little you just learn how to cope with the intensity of the experience and the futility of life. You know, so you become like a clown, you know, with your family, you laugh and you have a good time. But deep down, because what they see is not only the, you know, face paints, they see you laughing. But deep down, you just, you know, The other thing about longing is all your desires disappear except that one that creates good longing inside you. And it's a devastating place to be because no other desire can satisfy you. And the problem with longing is you have no power. You can't go to the person with the thing and say, listen, I want you. Can you want me back? It doesn't work that way. Which makes it even more frightening and more frustrating. And somehow, you know, um, if I suppose the flame of love is, is strong enough, you'll just hang on. I mean, it really devastates a good amount of things in your life as you're just moving through this. And it also may be the case that you may get nothing, you know. Um, but you don't even have to worry about that because, again, our mechanism, the way we are wired, that wired as human beings is that little by little, the intensity will dim, you know. and. Again, there is nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, if my father dies tonight, it's just a shock. And not really, I mean, he's 90, so... But let's just say he's like 60 and he all of a sudden dies, it's a shock. If, on the other hand, my father gets really, really sick, and then I have to go to Roosevelt every other day to take care of him, to be with him. And if after five months he dies, it's not going to be a great shock. It's a gradual death. It's a gradual experience where deep down at moments I say, God, just let my father die. I think longing is very much the same way. As you live with it, if it's not nourished the right way, little by little, it just dies. And all you have, once in a while, my brother and I will sit and say, Oh, Dad was a nice man. He failed his driving test. And he did today. You know. Um, it just becomes a memory. And it's a fond memory. You know, it's a memory where you can sit back with your good friends. 
and you know say yeah I remember you know you were younger you had lots of energy and uh, we drove five hours and it's it's a it's a great story you know uh, and you never know you know Layla may one day read a book and say mom I want to do this oh honey let me sit you down and talk to you about and you know you go back in time and so you know I think when you read the gospel of Matthew or the gospel of Luke the temptations are about that you know where Satan says to him uh, turn the stones into bread and people will follow you and when he says no I want people to understand and follow me because he understands that how longing can be destructive, how the spiritual quest could counter one's physical life and how it could damage it. And he doesn't want to tempt people, he doesn't want to bait people, you know, he doesn't want to say, okay, I'm a magician, let me show you what I can do, and then have these people follow. When they don't have the capacity when they're far too attached to their wives and their kids and their husbands and their life. Because once you follow Jesus and you realize the magic inside him, but you can't get to that magic yourself, what happens is you don't have Jesus. Your longing is not answered. And you know that when you go back to life, it's going to be relatively fake. And now you have neither of these worlds and it's devastating. And for the most part, he just desires to remain invisible. He says, no, I'm not going to trick anyone. You know, you find my door, you knock on it. You know, and if I'm home, I'll open it. But I'm not going to go out of my way to come looking for you, to tell you, come. It doesn't work that way. You know, and this, this gradual understanding is really, really good because it slowly makes you, forces you into awareness what's at stake, you know. And so your longing, to some extent, you know, remains protected. Uh, again, I think the best example really for us contemporary people is Carlos Castaneda. And what was nice about him is that you know, there are no videos of him. There is only one audio that's not even very audible. I can't really understand what that he's talking about. Um, there are lots of stories about him. And this is a man who comes to, I guess, realize that what he has is you know, a real gem. And he wants to protect it. And he wants to create this longing for this gem only for people who have the capacity. And to be honest, I don't know who does. You know, I mean, look at what, you know, parents do, what we do for kids or what we do for our companions. It's everything is a shot in the dark. You do piano, you do martial arts, you do basketball in hopes that one of them is the bait that they'll catch and they'll, they have some, like a talent or a gift for that particular thing. And I think students are very much the same way. You know, you throw different things and one says, okay, I like this. And then you have to sit back and say, okay, let me see how far they're going to go. Let me see how far they're willing to do this or to do that. And then if they break, they break. If they have doubts and they, you know, just suffocate under an avalanche of doubt, they just leave. That's how things are. There are no guarantees. It's not so much. I think as long as the longing lives inside you, you know, you're being baptized on the inside. Uh, but it can only last for so long before it slowly just decays. Is that what happens for everyone, even those who come to some kind of understanding? Does there 
longing also become lessened in that way? Or is it just those who don't have the capacity? You know, longing is, it's a mysterious world of all sorts of conflicting emotions. That's what longing is. When to some extent you have found the object of your desire and the longing dissipates when you live in what you have obtained you don't long for it anymore you have it and then you understand it once you understand it even when it disappears your longing has a different quality to it Let's say, I mean, it, even in ordinary circumstances, let's say you long to have a boyfriend, for example, or a girlfriend, or a car, whatever it is that you desire intensely. Then you get it. Now, it would just be very strange for you to have the Tesla and keep longing for what you have. You have it, there is no longing. What happens then, as you drive your car, there is this union between your desire and the desire being achieved, the object of your desire. And slowly they merge. And so your longing and the object become one and the same, and you're writing it there comes a point where you just no longer care for it. You know how it drives, you know how many miles it goes, you know how long it takes to charge it. And then that longing goes away and you have another kind of longing for another kind of a thing. You know, there is also some some real factors such as it depends how old you are it depends how busy your life is what lives inside your life you know you know if someone enjoys these ideas and all of a sudden they get the news like and say their parents live in Nebraska that you know, your mom has cancer, for example, and that the father calls and come and, you know. And I doubt very much if you happen to have a relatively good relationship with your parents, you're going to say, oh, okay, I'm just going to stay here, you know, and not go visit. There's a good chance that you're going to cut your ties with this stuff and go over there. So it really depends on you don't find very many people like Irina Tweedy where that's, that's a fantastic story because you're 50 and a 50 year old has so much stuff inside them you know and uh, <clears throat> you know more power to her because it really illustrates that despite having 50 years of history inside you you're not really that attached and you're willing to give that history away to this man and just have him delete or erase all of it. No one, I think, knows what their capacity is. You know the story in the Quran about Moses going to God and said, <clears throat> saying to God that You know, he says to God that I think I have the capacity to know more, I have the capacity to learn more, 
I can understand divine attributes better. I have the capacity for more divine knowledge and God says, Moses, be content. You are good. You don't, you know, remove greed from your soul. You're fine. He says, no. And God says, okay. You want more? I'll test you. And he gets tested and he fails three times. You know, there are those who think they have the capacity for greatness and they're tested and they fail. And then there are people like Bernadette who really believe themselves to be stupid and mysteries are revealed to her. I, I don't know. Capacities are only realized when you're being experimented on, you know. You know, the three of us, we have imagined ourselves to have a great amount of patience and, we, you know, we can tolerate a lot of things and we won't break. You know, it's this fantastic psychological narrative about patience that we have created for ourselves. And then you have a daughter. Every 10 minutes, she breaks you. You know, my sister was here yesterday, and uh, she was telling, uh, telling us, you know, I'm a screamer. When these kids were tiny, man, I just screamed every like minute at the top of my lungs. And you'll find many, many passages in the Qur'an where God says, where, you know, people down here say to God, please, please don't test us, because we will fail. You know, and it's, it's true. You know, sometimes, You know, Cassie, since you're a mother, you can understand this. Forgive me, I don't mean that. You know, you won't. You know, when your daughter was born, first it was milk. Then it was like mashed potatoes or carrots. Then she graduated into maybe tiny bits of ground beef. Then she graduated to chew steak. You know, there are two things here. There is the student who assumes that they're ready for steak. And then there is a novice teacher who says, I'm going to give you steak. So the steak is given to a novice student and he chokes or she chokes on it and they leave. That's one way where you're tested, but in all the wrong ways. The other is the student assumes that they have the capacity for steak the teacher says, no, let me just give you milk for now. The student argues, saying, no, I want steak. The teacher says, no, let me give you milk for now. The student assumes that he's got capacity for a great deal. The teacher knows he doesn't. Eventually, the student 
gets frustrated and leaves. The third scenario is that you have a student who assumes that they have the capacity for the stake. The teacher says no. The student says, maybe the teacher is right. But this maybe is just not an inspired moment. He or she really believes gradually that they don't have the capacity for the stake. So what they do is they open themselves and they become receptive to milk. I mean, this is not easy because it takes a long time for the student to get to a place where he says, okay, forget steak, just give me, me you know, give me milk. The teacher gives milk. Now, there's going to be very, very, a lot of moments where the student says, I'm tired of milk, I want steak. And again, they have to go back into submitting themselves to the teacher, saying, no, I think you're ready for some mashed potatoes. You know. Now, if the, the teacher happens to have, like other students who are eating steak, the teacher, the students may feel envy and jealousy, resentment, even anger, bias, unfairness, you know, that may cause the student to walk away, for example. <clears throat> or it may make the teacher feel really bad because he or she doesn't know what, you know, is the right way to teach people are. So he just gives the student a steak and the steak doesn't go well, the student leaves. You know. And so if you have the right teacher, you know, he or she will say to the student, listen, everybody in this group is at a different stage of growth and maturity. Just shut your mouth, do as I say. And if there is enough love, if there is enough trust, the student will simply be okay with that. Um, and then little, little, the capacity for stake is created, you know. But, you know, sometimes, Cassie, it's not so much about capacity. It's about people, you know, everybody has a different set of talents. You know, I don't know why Peter Buka, he's a 22-year-old Hungarian kid, I mean, he has this new piece out, Time, by Zimmer, Hans Zimmer, piano. It's it's beautiful, it, it's just amazing. I think when it comes to these things, there are people who just have the talent for it. And they become really, really good. There are those who don't have the talent, they just become okay. You know? uh, but you will never know any of this stuff unless you're touched by them. Someone experiments things on you to see how far you can go, how far you're willing to go. Uh, I think as it is a shot in the dark for the student, it's also a shot in the dark for the teacher. You know? And for lack of a better word that's a phrase it's really a dance that two people play you know and um, you don't know if it's going to go good or bad you know I mean look at the way Lillian that was her book Lillian Lillian wrote her book versus the way Irina wrote her book you know Lillian's book is okay. I mean, first, it's really thin. Second, there's a good amount of Lillian involved. Um, the way she relates to Maisab is very, very different. The way she relates to this stuff, you know, the path to wisdom is very different when you look at Irina. I mean, it's night and day. You know, they both want the same thing. 
but you know they they're approached differently. They are toyed with by Bai Sahib differently. You know, it seems like Bai Sahib has a great amount of respect for Lillian. You know, uh, she may even consider her as, or he may even consider her as a very mature, you know, student. Whereas Irina, no, he destroys her. I don't know if you can say maybe Lillian didn't have the capacity. I think their talents are different. Uh, maybe the capacity, if you want to use that word, I don't know. Or maybe I'm just not understanding your question. You know, one of the nice things about Idris Shah You know, you go on a spiritual quest simply because you're just very, very alone. And it's not because you've learned how to be alone and you know, you're great at being alone. You're just lonely and you feel pathetic. One of the things that Idi Shah does is that he says to this person that, listen, I know you like the Bible. I know you like going to church. I know you like fasting and praying and crying and weeping and all that stuff. But you're doing all of this really because you're lonely. If you don't accept the fact that you are lonely, and you really assume that you're spiritual, what's going to happen is there comes a point where you stop on the spiritual quest. And then you're going to feel as if you don't have the capacity for this journey, or you're too stupid, your confidence will go down, your life will kind of be destroyed. If you had only accepted that the only reason you're attracted to religion is because you want to somehow cope with the fact that you're lonely. If only you had gone to eHarmony.com, found yourself a nice companion, that would be a religion. You would never, you know, find the spiritual quest enjoyable. You know? So sometimes when you, know, you speak about capacities, the truth is some people just don't have the capacity for certain things. But because there are certain elements missing in their life, their physical life, you know, they grab onto this thing, imagining that that's the raft that will save them, when in fact in the long run it'll just destroy them. You know, and again, keep in mind that Idris Shah talks to Westerners. And the Western culture, for the most part, it's, it doesn't really nourish the human spirit. It really just destroys the human psyche in so many different ways. And so when someone comes and says, I want God, Idris Shah says, wait a minute. No, I don't think that's what you want. Maybe you want a therapist, maybe you want something else, but it certainly is not gold. And in some ways it's good because it's Idris Shah's energy, it's his time, it's his life that he has to spend on people. And he wants to make sure that it's the right vehicle. And this vehicle is going to go all the way and not get broken down in the middle of the highway, you know.